Hey y'all, here is our next lecture. It is about the federal bureaucracy and this is big in the news lately because there are all sorts of parts of the federal bureaucracy that is having an impact on the coronavirus situation that we're dealing with. So once again, it's a pretty timely lesson for us to be learning about. So let's go ahead and move on. So the federal bureaucracy is part of the executive branch. And so the executive branch is made up of the POTUS, the president of the United States, as well as the vice president. And then for your knowledge, you're going to have to know that there are five parts of the bureaucracy. And those are listed at the very bottom of this, uh, this chart. Um, and we'll go over these in particular and in specific. So, but the 15 cabinet departments, like the Department of Labor, the Department of Defense, the Department of Treasury. Then you have independent executive agencies like NASA. Then you have regulatory agencies like the FDA and the EPA. Then you have government corporations like the post office. And then you have the West Wing of the White House. So all of these make up the bureaucracy as we know it. So there are five parts of the bureaucracy. These are the five parts. For the cabinets, there are 15. For independent executive, there are tens of agencies. For regulatory agencies, there are literally hundreds. There are tens of government corporations. And then there are hundreds of people that work in the West Wing. Once we go over all of the different parts, you'll be able, this chart will make a whole lot more sense. So I really should have put it in the back of this lecture, but um, this just gives you a quick uh, rundown of what they do, how they're hired, how they're fired, stuff like that. So um, you can look at it now and press pause, or you can move on and then come back to it at the very end. For your worksheet now, you're going to want to jot down, starting here at the very top, that there are three purposes of the federal bureaucracy. They, they basically do three things. Number one, they administrate. They provide services and provide all of the administrative work to run the, the shows. Um, so they basically, this is when they provide services to everybody and really uh, work to provide those services. Um, and so... Anything that Congress passes, these guys have to then implement. And so that leads us to number two, implementation. Um, now, in order to implement, the, the executive branch has to hire people in order to do all of these things. So we're going to find out here in just a second that the federal bureaucracy is probably the largest employer in the United States, and that is to implement or carry out the laws of Congress. And then finally, the third thing that they do is they regulate. They issue regulations, and then they carry those regulations out. Um, so if you can remember AIR, A-I-R, then you can remember the three things that the federal bureaucracy does. There are currently about 2.5 million people who work in the federal bureaucracy. That is basically one out of every 100 people. So they employ about 1% of all of America. Now, not all of these people work in Washington, D.C. In fact, a small number of them walk, work in Washington, D.C. They literally work all over the United States. Every city has parts of the bureaucracy in it. Obviously, your bigger cities have more offices than your smaller ones do, um, including St. Louis. Originally, how would you have gotten a job in the bureaucracy? You would have been given a job based on your support of the winning candidate. That was known as the spoil system. So if you supported the presidential candidate and that presidential candidate won, then you were likely to get a government job. And if you were a supporter of the other guy, then you had to wait until the other guy or somebody else got elected. This is how things ran until the assassination of President Garfield by somebody who thought he was going to get a job and didn't, so he decided to take out his frustrations by shooting the president. And as a result of that assassination, Congress basically said, we need to change the spoil system into something a little bit better. And so they passed the Pendleton Act. The Pendleton Act gets rid of the spoil system and instead institutes the merit system where you have to earn your job based on merit. And so what we're going to find out is that most of the government workers have their jobs no matter who the president is. They are uh, workers who are there throughout all presidents. They are not partisan people. 
um, and they are known as the civil service. So the civil service was created through the Pendleton Act and the creation of the merit system. The Hatch Act attempts to try to regulate those who work in government by basically limiting what they can do and how they can support people while they're at their jobs. Basically, because they are supposed to be neutral, we don't want them to sort of demonstrate in political elections. We don't want them to be overly showy with their support. However, the Hatch Act has been softened over recent years because a lot of these employees uh, sued saying that the restrictions were too great and they said that they had a First Amendment uh, right to freedom of speech and, and show their support. And so those regulations through the Hatch Act have softened over the years. Um, basically, this slide is to show you that the political appointees make up a small percentage of the overall people who work in the federal bureaucracy. Now, this slide says that there are 2.9 million people who work in the federal bureaucracy. That has been cut uh, recently because of Donald Trump and his attempt to make government smaller. So that's down, down to about 2.5 million people. But you see that most of those people are civil service people. They are there and have their jobs despite who is the political president. Um, and so that's just what this slide here is, is showing you. Now let's go ahead and start tackling the five parts of the bureaucracy, the specific parts. And the ones that are most well known are the cabinet departments. Um, these are the ones, uh, there are 15 total and they are various sizes and statuses and visibilities. Uh, and their main job is to be presidential advisors. Um, they are supposed to act as experts in their policy area. And so if the president has a question about the military, he's supposed to go to his uh, secretary of defense and be able to ask any military question and have that uh politician be able to answer it. Same thing with education with the Secretary of Education or with transportation with the Secretary of Transportation. They also carry out broad tasks based on their uh, what their focuses are on. And they also provide necessary services. Um, but the big thing is, is they act as presidential advisors. They meet with the president about once a month. It's not a whole lot. Um, they are pretty much on their own. Uh, some of them talk to the president on a daily basis, maybe over the phone, like the Department of State or the Department of Defense. But somebody like the Department of Education, they're pretty much on their own. There are four cabinet departments that serve clientele groups, meaning that the cabinet department was created to specifically represent a group of people. Uh, farmers are represented by the Department of Agriculture. Businesses uh is um, represented by the Department of Commerce. Labor is represented by the Labor Department. And then finally, um, you have the veterans uh, represented by the Veterans Affairs. Um, now, all of these cabinet departments have smaller units under them. If you remember the poster that we did during the budget and everything that was on the right that was civilian, most of those were the cabinet departments. And you notice that those circles were bigger and that Next to those circles, they had smaller offshoots. Um, and that's what I mean by that the department has smaller, well-known units. Um, here are the 15 cabinet departments. You're not going to need to know them, um, but it's just good to be able to recognize them. They do have to be, the heads of each of these do have to be confirmed by the Senate because the Senate is confirmation power. Um, but remember that the cabinet is not required. It's not in the Constitution. It was just started by... George Washington and everybody since then has has gone with that tradition. Um, here is a list of all 15 of them and when they were created. And then here are some of the famous offshoots. So for the Department of Homeland Security, you have the INS, which is Immigration and Naturalization Service, which is basically in charge of customs and, and border security. You have the Secret Service and you have the Coast Guard. Uh, under the Justice Department, and you guys will remember this from the worksheet on the budget, the FBI, the Bureau of Prisons, the ATF, the DEA are all under the Justice Department. Uh, now, with what's going on with the coronavirus, Health and Human Services with the National Institutes of Health, uh, who's Dr. Fauci, who you see on the news all the time. He's the head of the Infectious Disease 
section of the NIH. You also have the CDC getting involved in everything um, with what's going on and where the outbreaks are. And you also have the FDA trying to approve new drugs or okay the use of other drugs with this. Um, that has also been big. You also see agriculture is in charge of things like the food stamp and the forest service. Uh, you have commerce in charge of NOAA, which is the national weather. Uh, and then you have them also running the census. And then you have the Department of Transportation running things like the FAA, which is in charge of all airports and, and airplanes. And then the security at airports is TSA. Um, and then you have the NTSB, the National Traffic Safety Board. Anytime there's a major transportation accident, plane, train, automobile, bridge, they go out and figure out what happened and, and how to make sure it doesn't happen again. Part two of the bureaucracy is the executive office of the president. These are the people who work with the president on a daily basis. Um, they are connected right off of his Oval Office. And so as the slide shows you, um, the offices that help develop and implement policies of the president, these are uh, the group that help the president do his thing on a daily basis. And it includes the National Security Council, the OMB, which helps him do budget, and then some big wigs like the person who runs his, off his uh, office space, and basically access to the president, the chief of staff, the press secretary. Uh, the press secretary used to meet with the press every day and give uh, press conferences uh, so that the press could ask questions of the administration. Trump has pretty much shut that down. Um, and so he really is the one that is the spokesman of himself. Um, so the, the executive office of the president are the people who work on a daily basis. Um, these two people, uh, this is uh, Sarah Sanders Huckabee or Sarah Huckabee Sanders, who was Trump's uh, second press secretary. Um, this is General Kelly, who was President Trump's second chief of staff. Um, and so this gives you just a little bit more uh, of a description of what some of these offices do. You're not going to need to know it, but a lot of people just want to know uh, a little bit more information about things. And so you can get that here. Um, here's just another part. Uh, that you can take a look at on your own by just pausing this and taking a look at some of the things that are under the uh, EOP. And then the three big ones that we talked about were the National Security Council, the OMB, and the Council of Economic Advisors. All of this under the EOB. Number three is the independent executive agencies. So these were... Uh, these were agencies that were not big enough to be a cabinet department but too big to fit within a cabinet department. And so what they just did is they just made a third category for these institutions. So they're too small to be in the cabinet, but too big to be inside of a cabinet. Uh, and usually they have a much narrower focus than what a cabinet uh, department would do. So for instance, NASA is only about space exploration. It's too big to fit inside, say, the Department of Defense or the Department of Transportation, but it was too small to be a cabinet department, so they just created uh, a whole new category. The CIA is also here, the Social Security is in here, Peace Corps is in here, and some other smaller ones as well. The fourth uh, group in the uh, bureaucracy, and the one that probably has the biggest impact on our daily lives are all of the regulatory agencies. So these were created, as the name just easily implies, to regulate our, get this, economy and society. So they both regulate economics and they regulate social behaviors. The other key thing that you need to know about these agencies is that they have all three powers of the government at their disposal. They have legislative powers to create regulations. They have executive powers to execute those regulations. And then they have judicial functions. If you want to appeal any fine that you are given, you have to appeal first through them. So they have both legislative, executive, and judicial powers. And the only part of the government that has all three. Um, Obviously, with the regulatory agencies, it depends upon the president. Um, the regulatory agencies under liberals or Democrats tend to regulate society more, 
And when you have uh, the Republicans in charge, they tend to deregulate more um, just because of their view of government. And so uh, regulatory agencies tend to crank up or crank down depending upon what party is in charge uh, at that time. Um, some famous regulatory agencies include the EPA, uh, which would be um, dealing with uh, obviously pollution in the United States. Uh, you also have the FCC, which regulates all forms of communications, including TV. Why can you not have nudity on TV? Because of the FCC. Uh, why can you not cuss on the radio? Because of FCC. Now, cable, you notice, is not listed here because that is subscription or private based. And so they can do whatever they want because they are not a public airwave. Uh, same thing with Sirius XM Radio. You can listen to Howard Stern cuss up a storm and he's not going to get in trouble because he's no longer regulated by the FCC because he's on satellite radio. Um, you also have the FCC. EC, which we will talk about more when we talk about uh, campaign finance and all the laws about running for president. You also have OSHA, which regulates work environments. So you have, and these are just a, a few of the hundreds of regulatory agencies that make up the uh, this part of the bureaucracy. I want you to look up the 2004 Super Bowl halftime show featuring Justin Timberlake and Janet Jackson and figure out how this story relates to the FCC and regulatory agencies. I will tell you that there was a certain circumstance that happened during this halftime show that got CBS and Janet Jackson in trouble with the FCC. So look it up and then figure out how it relates to the regulatory agencies. Finally, you have government corporations. These are businesses that are run by the government, either because it's such an important service that they want to make sure that it's done right and correctly. Think of the post office. Um, or number two, they want to keep the service cheap and inexpensive. Again, think of the post office or think of Amtrak. Amtrak, um, no private provider would want to do that. Um, and so the government does it to make sure that that service is given, especially on the East Coast, railroads and rail traffic is extremely important for passengers. Um, and so these make up the government corporations. Again, we'll take a look at political appointees later. Uh, just right now, we're going to skip through this part, um, but you can look up some of Donald Trump's uh, more controversial political appointees, including Scott Pruitt, um, who headed up the EPA and why he was such a controversial uh, person to head up the EPA. Once you look at his biography, you'll see why it was such a, a controversial appointment in the first place. Um, I also want you to go back and take a look again at privatization. Privatization is basically deregulation to the fullest degree. Um, and how the Republicans really believe in privatization. They don't want the government to be involved hardly in anything, and they want things to be done privately, whereas liberals would be just the opposite. Democrats would be just the opposite. Uh, controlling the bureaucracy, you need to know that Congress can control the bureaucracy by appropriating money or not appropriating money. Um, they also get to do oversight, so I really need to add oversight. In fact, I'm going to do that right now. The power of oversight that they get to investigate the bureaucracy and what they're doing. Um, they also get to confirm appointments to the bureaucracy. So those are some key legislative controls. Obviously, the president can control uh, the bureaucracy by appointing people to jobs and making sure that they do it the way that he likes or she likes. He can also or she can also issue executive orders telling the bureaucracy to do something or not do something. Um, and they can reorganize the bureaucracy as long as they're not uh, creating anything new. Um, and then obviously the judicial branch can control the bureaucracy by using judicial review to declare actions constitutional or unconstitutional. The final thing I want to go over is something known as the Iron Triangle. The Iron Triangle is basically an answer to how is public policy made in the United States? How are laws done? 
Uh, and laws are basically created by the relationship between the bureaucracy, Congress and Congress committees, and then interest groups. And these three groups have such a strong relationship to each other that they have created something called